Welcome to the Pet Loss Companion. I'm Ken Dolan Del Vecchio, and I'm here with my friend and co-author, Nancy Saxton Lopez, and also a guest who will be with us for this episode. And we're really interested in hearing everything that she has to say. First, I just want to give the intro that we usually do and let you know that this is a program that grew out of the book that Nancy and I wrote. It's called The Pet Loss Companion, Healing Advice for, from Family Therapists Who Lead Pet Loss Groups. And that book is based on decades of facilitating support groups for people who have lost their pet 30 plus years for Nancy, 12 plus years and, and counting for me. And this medium allows us to dialogue with you. And so we invite you to send us your stories, your questions, your suggestions for guests. And we really appreciate those because it's through sharing the stories that many of you have sent us that so many people get solace and support. So you can reach me at kenddv at gmail.com. That's K-E-N-D-D-V at gmail.com. You can reach Nancy at nsaxtonlopez at csmpc.com. That's N-S-A-X-T-O-N-L-O-P-E-Z at csmpc. Dot com. By the way, all this information I'm sharing in the introduction is in the description for the program, and so you can pick it up there as well. Let us know if you send us a personal story, whether it would be okay to share with the audience. And we know that that's very helpful for many people. If you perhaps would prefer that we don't share it, with, that's fine as well. Mm -hmm. And we will respond to you. One or both of us will respond to your questions and comments and stories in any case. You can support our work in a number of ways. You can support through, give us a, a gift of support through Venmo or PayPal, even a monthly subscription. Again, all of this is in the program description. We always say this with a bit of a tentative tone because we don't, we're not asking you to give us money. We, we of course appreciate it. It's gratifying, but we really do this because we think it's, we know it's useful for people and it's kind of like a labor of love. So that's really why we do the program. The program is a friend of Dakin Humane Society in Springfield, Massachusetts. You can learn more about Dakin at D-A-K-I-N-H-U-M-A-N-E.org. It's a great program. In fact, one of the one of the resources that it offers is a cost-free Zoom pet loss support group that I facilitate once a month, second Tuesday of the month. It runs 7 p.m. to 7, I'm sorry, 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. It is entirely free. You just need to RSVP at Dakin's site and the link to do so is in the description. The next meeting will be on Tuesday. Uh, February 14th, so Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. And we've had people from all over the world. You don't need to be local in order to join this, this meeting. You can come from as far away as England or Australia, <laughs> all across the US. There have been people participating. And one final point, and that is that if you find this program useful, please consider subscribing on YouTube. Because if you subscribe on YouTube, and again, there's a link in the in the description on how to do this. It will help other people who are searching for support on YouTube to find our program higher on the list. It will affect the algorithm in, in a way that, that helps them to see our, our program. So I'll stop there. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest. Her name is Andrea Cole. She is a veterinarian and she practices at South Deerfield Veterinary Clinic. She's been there since September of 2021. She grew up in central Massachusetts and much of her training has been in other places. So she attended Hamilton College in upstate New York for her undergraduate studies in Washington State University for, for veterinary school. In addition to her DVM, she holds a master's in public health mm -hmm. from the University of Minnesota. And Dr. Cole enjoys a variety of mixed animal, the variety of mixed animal practice, loves working with cats and small ruminant, ruminants, camelids. I'm actually interested in getting those. So 
be talking with more, her more about that, as well as doing client education. And she is also a person who enjoys farming with her husband and daughter and other activities when she has what little free time she has, such as jigsaw puzzles and, and going out for, to eat for great food. We'll post the information on her practice on our site so you can learn how to how to get in touch with her at South Deerfield Veterinary Clinic. And I also want to tell you that I met Dr. Cole when I brought in sequence over the course of a couple of months, chickens. chickens who were at the end of their lives. And I have to tell you, I found her to be one of the most empathic and caring veterinary practitioners who I've ever encountered. And very, very moving the way she handled with such care my animals and and me. And so it's just a wonderful thing to have her with us. Mm -hmm. And so welcome, Dr. Cole. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Cole, so much uh, for coming on our show. And we have a topic today that is very important to everyone who has an animal, a pet. Um, and that is finances. Um, you know, having, you know, an animal that all of a sudden has a chronic disease or, or, or something that's terminal or an accident when they go into an ER. Um, and everyone said, oh my gosh, I can't believe how much money this is. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we want to talk about you know, I mean, my sense is that the cost um, of, you know, veterinary practice, you know, treatments is high, but it's not any higher than humans. I, I would, I don't know, though, but this is a question for you, yeah. you know, to, to talk about a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for having me. I, I really enjoy what you do. I think it's so meaningful. And I'm glad you're reaching so many people with it. Um, so I appreciate everything. I, I guess I wanted to say just a little bit more about me and how I ended up okay. here and agreeing to do this. Um, <laughs> I, I have been at general in general practice where Ken um, talked about since last year. Um, before that, I was in emergency practice. And mm. I burned out of that pretty quickly. Yeah. I was there for a few years. And... Every single day was a discussion on finances, mm -hmm. not just every day, but almost every patient. And it is a huge issue in our industry. It's, it's mm -hmm. definitely a beast of a topic that we're going to try to cover. It's really complex and there are lots of facets to it. But one of them is that it, it really does contribute to veterinary professional burnout, yeah. fatigue, um, our suicide rates, all of those things yeah. that we can talk about another time. Mm -hmm. but, sure. but, um, but I do, I do just mention it to say that I, I have experience with, um, sorry. Can you see me? Oh dear. Can you see me? Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I do have experience in emergency practice in some of these scenarios that we're going to talk about, um, Quite a bit. So, but my perspective might be different than yours. Um, I have to, I'll, let me get my dog. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, what about that? Has the care, the cost of care gone up in recent years? And if yeah. so, why? Yeah. So, I think, I think there's a couple things to address with that question. In the last few years, absolutely, the cost of care has gone up. It, you know, in, in doing some thinking about my costs from my last practice in emergency and general practice, absolutely they've gone up, but they all have gone up relative to the cost of other things, right? Mm -hmm. We have to remember, which is hard to do sometimes, we have to remember that veterinary medicine is predominantly a service industry and a retail industry. We do try and we're trying to push towards being predominantly a medical industry, right, and trying to take away some of these financial aspects to it, as we know, right, we, human insurance and human medicine is a whole other complicated matter. But, you know, for the most part, we are providing retail, we're providing service. And the cost of all of that across the board has gone up over the last few years, right? With COVID, we have supply chain issues, we have 
a shortage in staff. We have mm-hmm. an increase in wages. We have to provide the cost of medications and um services that our labs provide, services that we can provide patients diagnostically have gone up. And so across the board. And so that's something we have to reflect in our prices, right? Wow. And so why all of that is happening economically around the country, it's, it's really not veterinary specific, I would say. Um, you know, in the last six months with inflation going up everywhere, we've had to raise prices as well, right? We just simply can't keep the doors open if we don't charge enough for a medication, right? So that's something that I think we have to try to remember in in terms of what our profession actually is and what we're trying to achieve is good quality medical care, but we have to be charging for it. And our charges are always reflective of what the companies of things that we can give charge us, right? Now, the, now it's interesting, and, and, and my sense of this is, is, you know, humans, we have insurance, and when we go somewhere to be treated, we hand them a, a card, right? Yeah. And, and so we don't see any kind of payment yeah. unless it's a copay or right. a deductible that mm-hmm. comes. And I think that people, pet parents and guardians, they, they don't get that, right? Because when they come into a veterinarian, they say, oh, well, insurance, well, no, you have to pay up front. Because yeah. that's how insur- uh, pet insurances work. Yep. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the big piece as well. It's, you know, you can think of it like you go out to dinner, right? You're going out to dinner, you're asking for a service and you're asking for a specific thing, you pay before you leave, right? We're at the point where we do the same thing. And when you go to your doctor, your medical expenses, for the most part, you don't ever see, right? Um, But if you look about, if you look at the cost of human medical care compared to veterinary medical care, yes, you're paying out of pocket, but it is a fraction of the cost of what human medical care is. Right. And so when you try to compare the systems, you're really looking at apples versus oranges. Um, and so it is, it's definitely real, right? It's real when you're pulling money out of your pocket. But if you're looking at the statistics, the cost of veterinary care is really a fraction of what humans would be paying for a very similar service. And it's good, it's good care. I mean, you have the same machines that, that would be in a hospital. For humans, right? Yeah. I mean, MRI machines, you know, mm-hmm. ultrasounds, you yeah. know, all of the laboratory work and stuff yeah. is yeah. the same. So, so I wish that people would understand that. But of course, when they come into an ER, and I'm doing that specifically, that they're very upset and they and they they're they're emotional. So yeah. the first thing that they will say, I can't believe this is so much money. I, you know, you only want money, you know, and this is you. I'm sure you heard that. Quite yeah, a bit. unfortunately, a lot. I yeah. think. Yeah, and I think that's the other thing to consider here with costs coming up is, yes, in the last few years, we talk about just inflation and COVID and all of that. But if we look back several decades, even back 100 years, you have to think about the shift that has happened physically in our country and around the world. Animals are no longer just, you know, uh, working animals. They're no longer for agriculture or just for business, we have taken our animals and brought them in the home, right? And we've made them these huge aspects of our lives. You know, the AVMA puts out studies um, every now and then, the most recent ones reflecting kind of just how many households have companion animals, and that has exploded in several several decades. Mm -hmm. And so you're asking an industry that by by and large, has about the same amount of vets in the country, right? Similar graduation rates over the last several decades to take on this huge influx of companion animals and provide services to all of them. So that's an aspect. But also now we're we're talking about treating members of our family, right? Yeah. And before we could very, you know, maybe not easily, but we could more easily decide to euthanize or make a cost benefit analysis on something that was looked at as business, right? Or agriculture or not as important in our lives, right? But culturally, 
we have shifted our mindset to have these be members of our family. And with that comes a push, right? It comes a push for our profession to be just as cutting edge as human medicine, to provide those things you're talking about, MRIs, to be able to diagnose and treat conditions like we would a family member, right? And with that, you have to train people, right? You have to train veterinarians to do that. That's a change in education and the cost of education. You have to be able to have a hospital that can keep and maintain and pay for an MRI and have a doctor to read that. And so all of those things are cost. They kind of, they accumulate and certainly they become expensive, but we're asking the standard of care to Mm -hmm. often what we would want our family member to be treated with and the options that we have for a family member to be there when they weren't before and with that comes cost. That that's one of the things that that really strikes me, and it it, it seems to be one of the points that creates dilemmas for people because mm-hmm. they are offered a level of options that maybe 10, 15 years ago they might not have been presented with. They might have mm-hmm. been told simply your your animal is really at a point where there's not much more we can do for them. That's, that's, that's what strikes me that, that Mm -hmm. when you go to, when your animal has an emergency or has some kind of very, very serious infirmary infirmity or illness. Now there's just these new, these new questions of uh, whether or not you're going to fund care Mm -hmm. that's going to be very, very expensive potentially. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, similar to human medicine, we've got a whole pharmaceutical industry now, right? right? Maybe didn't exist quite quite a while ago. And and it's good in part because we have specific veterinary research to come out with specific veterinary medications that are more effective for our patients, that are safer for our patients. But those FDA trials and those patents are expensive and they're reflected in what we offer legally, right? The legal system has changed as well. Legally, I can now offer. Ah, there's a baby there. Um, I, I'm going to offer a medication that's approved to be more safe, more effective for our companion animals because we have the research we didn't have. But that comes with a patent and that comes with a price. Now, also, so the, oh, go ahead, Ted. No, I, I was going to, I was going to ask you about about pet health insurance. Mm -hmm. And we spoke briefly before we get started. And I, and I told you my, my experience as a, as a clinician who, who has worked with, with human beings that I have, I have, I have such a low opinion of Mm -hmm. health insurance. I, I, as I told you, I, I see it primarily as a criminal enterprise. That's really the way I think about it when it comes to what's available for human beings. And so I've never gotten health insurance from my pets Mm -hmm. because I figured it was probably a scam. And, and I'm wondering, like, can you talk some about the, the pros and cons of health insurance? Are there particular kinds of uh, features in, in pet health insurance that are valuable and then not so valuable? Yeah, I think, Uh, I think something to remember for insurance is that it's fairly new. Um, I I think the ASPCA has one of the oldest insurance um, plans that that they offer, but there's all these different companies now that offer different things. And so my general sense is that we're still figuring it out. Um, I, I also think it's important to, remember along those lines that since we're it's kind of new we don't really have the statistics on it yet or the numbers on how well it works how people feel about it those sorts Mm -hmm. of things um in europe and australia i know they've got more information that's it's a much larger industry for them Mm -hmm. um i personally have seen a lot more pet insurance come through the doors in the last few years than i ever did um those owners tend to be very satisfied with their plans. Um, mm. They report to me that it seems really easy to use, that they can tailor it to exactly what they want it to mm. cover and not, which I don't think we can always do with our human health insurance plans, right? Mm. Um, and 
we also have just a closer relationship, I think, with those companies and with those clients than this kind of like meta insurance that we sometimes get in a circle with, with on the human side. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so I have the other thing I think I find and the thing that we know, we do know from European studies is that owners who have pet insurance tend to have more compliance with things medically speaking, and they tend to want to do more diagnostics and want to treat those chronic conditions because it seems more affordable um, and it works for them in those plans. Um, The other thing that I I briefly want to just mention is we do have some studies coming out that say that on the veterinary professional side, it, the, um, exposure pet insurance and having pet insurance from clients has also kind of decreased some of the burnout I was talking about. It's mm-hmm. taken some of those conversations of finances off the table mm-hmm. and allowed for vets to just focus on the care, right? And taken some of that away so that the client and the vet can have a conversation about what is actually best without talking price. Um, whether or not it turns into a scam long term, I don't know, Ken. Um, mm-hmm. I, th- I think personally, I would feel more comfortable with a program through like the ASPCA or something uh, humane society related, something like that versus I do know some banks, Wells Fargo and those sorts of companies are coming out with plans you can add on to your own sorts right. of. Um, oh, wow. I, I don't know how that's going to go. I probably personally wouldn't buy into that, but, um, you know. <laughs> no, really. Wells Fargo, I mean, how many times have they been in, in legal jail? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I won't I won't. Well, the the uh, other thing is that as a person who does have pet insurance, has had mm. pet insurance for 25, 30 years. Now, in the beginning, obviously, it was not, it really it really wasn't cost effective because you were paying and yet you were never getting money back. Right. Yeah, now that had there. definitely changed over yes. time. Now, I mean, you can, you can have insurance, you can have, you know, this bronze or the silver or the gold, you know, mm-hmm. uh, coverage. Yeah. Like just the like other insurance. Yeah. And, you know, you, I, I do pay quite a bit, you know, however, they do look at, at pre-existing conditions. So if you rescue, like I rescued Boogie, who was the one in here making a lot of noise. But um, when I rescued him, and he is epileptic, and so immediately um, the insurance company said, well, we're not going to cover anything with that. Yes. So, I mean, it's similar to some, yeah. you know, human yeah. insurances, but you can get coverage just for wellness or you could get catastrophic coverage only. Okay. But you know, or there's something in the middle. I've had really good experience with one one particular company, mm-hmm. um, even though, and Ellie, who's paraplegic and has issues, um, has been covered. She, none of her wellness stuff is covered, but almost all of everything else has been covered. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're, you, you've had a, a mixed experience. Mm-hmm. But it's well, in the beginning, years ago, it, it was it was really antiquated. I mean, there was, or there was no, there wasn't really anything that you could get out of it. Although I do know that the, I do have nationwide now because it was VPI in the beginning and they really basically cover nothing. So. Yeah. And I think something that we're going to see it more coming back to our first question is they're starting to offer those like wellness plans and Mm -hmm. add-ons to preventative care, like dentals and things Mm -hmm. that are becoming very expensive just to have your basic yearly checkup and flea and tick medications and those sorts of things that people can kind of tailor their plan. Um, When, you know, maybe several years ago, it wasn't a big deal for them to afford just the routine stuff out of pocket. Now it it might be. Um, And so that's something you can kind of work with the provider with. And so I I do like that aspect. I think we're evolving, but again, Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the companies have that quite flushed out as as well as we would hope. Um, and I think it's important for people to know, like Nancy was saying, is um, 
not unlike human insurance you do when you show up you still are paying out of pocket for the most part you're going to your visit you're paying out of pocket for the entire visit and then you're submitting something for reimbursement um, so we're not at a place yet where you go in and pay a copay um, and then they cover it right away so that is just something you still do have to plan for and budget yeah for. most yeah. of them are like that i think i think one is true panion actually will just do a deductible so you even if it's seven hundred bucks, you put seven hundred bucks, but the bill may be three or four thousand dollars, right? So, but the next day, because this is my experience from Blue Pearl, um, the next day it's paid. Mm-hmm. True Panion pays out the rest. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, also True Panion I have for Boogie, and no, no epilepsy here. We're not going to cover that. So, and and it is still expensive. But I also think that for for our audience. If you're not going to get pet insurance, you need to put money away. Yeah. I was going to you ask need, that, that question. And what, what's the strategy? I also just want to let people know that Dr. Cole has provided us with a, a whole list of resources that are, are available for you to seek financial assistance mm-hmm. for veterinary care. So we'll include that list in the description as well. But what do you say about that? How how should a person plan for the cost of veterinary care? Yeah, I, I think it's going to depend on a couple of things. If you're in a position to plan before you get an animal, by that I mean choose a certain breed of dog or decide you're going to go with a purebred dog versus adopting a dog, or you know you want a senior animal and that's kind of your style mm-hmm. versus you know, you want a puppy or a kitten, think about those things first. Sure. Able to, um, that's going to be hugely important, right? I see everyday people getting breeds of dogs that they had no idea tend to have certain conditions, medical predispositions to allergies or, um, you know, certain types of, um, respiratory diseases, things that are going to, probably pop up and be very expensive long term. If you're set on a breed, do your research, right? Know possibly what you're going into. That's going to help you budget a little bit or at least start that conversation with your vet about, okay, so I got a chihuahua. I know they're predisposed to dental disease. What should I be looking at yearly? Because a dental might be included in that. Right. Whereas you get another breed of dog and yeah, we'll do a dental every four or five years, right? Um, that That's the first thing, piece of advice I would have. Um, the second part I, I would say is to think about your own medical expenses. If you have some sort of budget for what you would want, like a little emergency fund to look like for a family member or for yourself. And I would aim, I would shoot for little eggs set aside for veterinary care. Um, you know, that's, that tends to be probably a similar relationship. And then, I mean, the other thing that's really important is to have a conversation with your family about what are your limits, right? Yeah. What, yeah. what are your expectations yeah. in owning an animal? What are your limits for treating a chronic condition or an emergency situation that pops up? And how much are you willing to spend or put towards that? And and would the scenario change that for you? Because what happens is sometimes you get in these situations and if you've never had that conversation, you can end up in a, a pretty big hole pretty quickly, right? And And you also can end up in a very emotionally charged situation where people in the same family aren't on the same page. Right. So having those conversations beforehand will help you figure out exactly kind of how much to budget, right? Um, I myself, I have this conversation with with my husband. I, you know, even as a vet, I I don't get just free services. I I have to pay for all the things that that I might have to do if my animal had a a surgery or an emergency situation. And I know that I wouldn't spend an unlimited amount depending on the case. So we kind of know what that limit is for us and what our finances are going to be allocated towards every year or about every six months. And then we can go from there. 
That's really important. I think I like what you're saying, you know, because if you have that idea, then like you said, in an emotionally charged situation, because we've had, Ken, we've had emails of people who say, we, I spent, we said, spent every dime we had, yeah. Yeah. you know, no, on our animals and, yeah. And, yeah. and they would start to have this just anxiety about finances. Right. And we would do it, but then how am I going to live? There were all these questions, yeah. you know, about how they were going to survive because they loved, it was a family member, right? It's, it's so, such a dilemma. It's such yeah, a dilemma it's because, tough. Because I, I can envision saying it's going to be this limit and then, and then here's my dear little friend, and I'm told that we need to go over the limit if we're going. And there's a potential this could save their life. And then, like you, you, you're still in a dilemma. I mean, it's good to have the limit because it's good to have that sort of yeah, that boundary in there. In mind, that you have it yeah. in mind. Mm -hmm. Hard, it's hard stuff. It is, and I think, I think that with what you're saying, Nancy, is it brings me to to something I did want to just highlight for people is the importance of having a good relationship with your vet. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, oftentimes if you're having an emergency situation, you know, and it's after hours or a weekend or something, you have no choice but to go over. When they are. Mm -hmm. But if it's not those times when you have a good working relationship with a vet, and by that I mean somebody you've gone to yearly, you've gotten preventative stuff done with, they, we are often just really giving with our time, our advice, and trying to work with you guys to figure out what's the best plan here. And I think it also opens and kind of builds a trust in relationships oh, yeah. and have those conversations about finances. Um, the last thing that any vet wants to do is put somebody oh, no. in house, yeah, right? Yeah. So oh, well, that's that's what your burnout, right? I mean, in the ERs, that's what would happen so much. I mean, like you said, having finances or having those those insurances took some of that pressure off of an animal coming in, and they just can't afford to take care of it anymore. And, mm -hmm. and they have to euthanize their, their animal. And it's just heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not what they best want to do, you know, if they don't have to. Yeah. I, I remember the, the, the most, and, and, and Dr. Cole, I've had, I had four chihuahuas for many years. And, <laughs> and now I have two dogs that are, that are mixed breeds. But I would say at the end of their lives, I would say to, to our vet, and I'm, we've heard this question many, many times. What, what would you do if it were mm -hmm. your pet? And it, it's a very when you when you're talking, as you said, when you're talking with somebody who you know and have regard for, that's that's a really important conversation to have. And and, and my vet most recently for my dog said, "Well, you love her, but I can tell you where you stand clinically." And that was so <laughs> affirming. It was just so yeah. affirming, and it really helped us, my husband and I, to make the decision to mm -hmm. to let let this one go. Yeah. I think we need to wrap up because oh, we, we could talk all afternoon. We <laughs> going, so maybe we'll have you on again if you're agreeable to it. Sounds like you would be agreeable to yeah. joining us again. Yeah. And you raised some very important points that we didn't get a chance to to talk about really at all. And I and I think it might be very helpful for one of those points about the stress on veterinarians. Yeah. I think so many times we hear from people that they, you know, they kind of hit a wall with the care or, or maybe the veterinarian that, that who they spoke with didn't seem to be so, uh, so generous and kind in, in having a conversation with them. So, so what you said, I think might be really illuminating for a lot mm -hmm. of people yeah. about, about the That'd stress and the actual suicide rate and all of that. But we want to thank you very much yeah. for our being with us. It was really informative so conversation. You're welcome. I would love to join you guys again and talk more. And I appreciate you having me. Oh, it's been great. Yeah, thank you again. Yeah.